In this lecture, we'll look at some observational strategies that can help with a qualitative biomechanical analysis. We'll be looking at free body diagrams, vector representations, and discussing how force vectors can help to visualize motion. A free body diagram is an isolated drawing of an object that is assumed to have rigid segments. Free body diagrams are simplifications of the situation, but they retain most of the characteristics that are relevant. Therefore, there's some subjectivity or skill associated with drawing the free body diagram, but there are also some rules that shouldn't be ignored related to the scientific principles behind this. Let's look at how we would make a simple representation of a human body. Think of the skeletal structure and draw straight lines to represent long bones in the arms and legs. You'll need to estimate the joint center, so do the best you can. We can then draw simple shapes to represent more complex skeletal structures like the head, chest, and hips. The rigid body must have a shape that is sufficient to include all points of application for the forces acting on the body. You may need to have different free body diagrams for different sports. The orientation of the body must be similar to the actual orientation observed in the skill. The main purpose of free body diagrams is that they help you focus on critical joint movements and postures. Now, if we take this very simplified free body diagram without any context, you'll notice that it's really difficult to understand what the athlete is doing in this situation. One thing we need to consider is that there are benefits and limitations to using free body diagrams. What do we gain or lose from only paying attention to the free body diagram? Some of the benefits are removing unnecessary visual information and allowing you to focus on the structural movements, and it applies rigid segments where forces act, making it a little bit easier to understand how movement is created. However, there are some limitations as well. You're going to lose perspective, as it's difficult to determine which plane movements are happening in. Depth can also be lost, as it's fairly difficult to represent each limb well in three dimensions when drawing a two-dimensional stick figure. Additionally, range of motion of more complex structures such as the neck, shoulder, and ankle are very difficult to represent in a free body diagram. And finally, there's some subjectivity when marking joints. You need to make sure that you're marking the joint centers as accurately as you can, but it's not going to be perfect. But really, free body diagrams are just stick figures that represent the human body, and it's another observational tool in your toolbox. They aren't necessary, but it does help to visualize the underlying movement of the skeletal structure, where movement occurs, and where forces are acting. You can imagine a free body diagram while watching your athlete to help visualize where forces are acting, or better yet, draw a free body diagram on a still image from a video recording. Next, let's take a look at vectors and vector components. A vector can be thought of as an arrow connecting two points. There are three important properties of a vector. The direction, which is where the arrow points, the magnitude, which is the length of the vector, and the point of application, which is where the vector is acting on the body. Vectors can be very useful tools to help understand many aspects of biomechanics. You can look at movement along a basketball court, internal joint forces, external forces from contacting another object, or represent non-contact forces such as gravity acting on your athlete. All of these rely on vectors, so we're using vectors to represent forces as well as movements. Visualizing the direction of a vector is important. Let's say we're pushing a table. So we're producing a force vector, and in this example, the vector is going to be moving forwards. If we look at our frame of reference in the image, we have left and right, and forward and backward. Since the force is only acting forward, the table should only move forward. Now, let's take a look at what would happen if we change the direction of the force vector. If we now push the table a little bit forward and a little bit to the left, we're going to expect the table to follow suit and move in that direction, a little bit forward and a little bit to the left. But we need to know how much forward and how much left. We do this by breaking that initial force vector into components. In this case, forward and left components. Or you could think of them as X and Y components. So to represent these component vectors, we're going to be drawing a line starting from the origin of the initial force vector and moving parallel to the axis of interest. If we start with the left vector, we can draw a line moving parallel from the initial application of force along the left axis until the point where it reaches the edge of the tip of the initial force vector. We do the same thing with the forward component, again starting from the initial point of force application and extending up to the tip of the initial force vector. Now, to add these two components together, you can use the tip-to-tail method. This means slide the forward component over along the left axis so that the origin of the forward component starts at the tip of the left component. You should now see that the addition of the left and forward component vectors equals the sum of the initial, or resultant, force vector. Most often, we will be considering vectors in three dimensions. Similar to applying force in two dimensions, you can simply break the force vector down into components along each axis. Importantly, it doesn't matter which order you add the vectors. So you could start with the vector moving to the left, then draw the vector moving forward, and then from the tip of the forward vector, draw the vector moving upward. Now, to calculate the resultant vector, instead of going tip to tail, we're going to go tail to tip. So start from your first vector, which was the vector moving along the left axis. That's where the origin will be. Then draw the vector 
from the origin to the tip of the upward vector. This gives us the final resultant vector in three dimensions. Now let's take a look at how we can use vectors to help represent movement of a player using free body diagrams. The first thing we need to do is draw the skeleton frame. Remember this is going to be representing the skeleton, including long bones and major things like the head, shoulders and hips. From there, think about what the external forces are. This will include contact forces, which will be comprised of action and reaction forces, the force of gravity, and movement vectors. It's also important to include a legend. You need to indicate what color or vector is representing each force or movement. Another thing to consider is that these are vector quantities that include both magnitude and direction, so you need to be representing changes in magnitude and direction. So that means if something moves faster, you increase the length of the movement vector, and if something changes direction, you change the direction of that movement vector. If we apply more or less force, we will also scale those vectors appropriately. Always keep this in mind when you're drawing your free body diagrams. These are vector quantities, and they must change in magnitude and direction as the situation warrants. Now it's time for you to practice. Take an image, draw a free body diagram, and then try to accurately represent the forces and movements happening in that diagram. Now, a convention for drawing free body diagrams is to represent the movements that are happening from the previous actions to the current frame, rather than thinking about what's happening from that frame onward. So that means if you're starting from a standing position and moving into a squat, you'll be representing movement going down towards the ground. All right, you've added a new observational tool to your toolbox, free body diagrams and vectors. Make sure to use these whenever they're appropriate to help you better understand, clarify, or simplify a situation. This can be useful when you're trying to break down the fundamental movements happening or when you're trying to convey that message to the athlete during the instruction phase of your qualitative biomechanical analysis.